You know what makes relationships better? True realness, vulnerability, people living their truth, people being more real, being more upfront, more direct. You know what makes you more attractive on a date? Being more real. Mm -hmm. Not going there, you people worry about their hair and like, is this all right? Be, tell a real fucking story on the date. Yeah. That's what's gonna, you wanna talk about deep attraction, not surface level bullshit. Deep, surface level bullshit is in 2D on Instagram. Deep attraction, the kind of attraction that gets relationships comes from real stories, yeah. real shared experiences. Welcome back everyone to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got one of my dear friends, Matthew Hussey, in the house. My man, super pumped. Back again. Last time you were on was four years ago. We thought it was three, and then I went back I and know, looked man. at it, it's and crazy. you, uh, yeah. It's crazy. Four years. And that episode blew up, and it continues to get a lot of traction on YouTube and audio, and you continue to blow up. You have a massive audience uh, on social media, on YouTube, your email, you have thousands of women that come to your live retreats every year, you know, thousands of people who are part of your courses and your programs, and you serve so many women who are struggling all the time in finding uh, the right match for them, uh, a loving partnership, and uh, a man or a partner they want to be with. And you've been helping women for, I think, almost a decade now, is that right? Eight to ten I, years? I, over, yeah. Ten I, years. It's been over a decade now. You're this right? is the ten... This year is the 10 year anniversary of our retreats. Wow. And the retreat started, I don't know, three or four years into me doing what I do. Wow, man. You, see, so you started when you were like 15, teaching I was women how to... Se I was 18 when I started, but I was working with men then, not women. Right. When I was 21, I really made that transition to working with women, uh, and I've been doing that ever since. It's amazing, man. And it's interesting. There's a lot that's happened in the last four years, yeah. because Tinder really started exploding you know, four years ago, I think. It was kind of four, three, two years ago that was coming and, around. And perhaps lost its taboo, maybe, yeah. in that time. Yeah, exactly. And then all the other apps came out to make it more accessible to swipe left and swipe right. Yeah. And Instagram became a dating app, essentially, in itself. <laughs> and Snapchat and all these social media apps are just now yeah. dating and looking at, there's thousands of options. It seems like there's so many good options, yet not one great option for anyone. Well, when you say, you know, they've all become t dating apps, it, then it makes me feel we've come full circle, because wasn't that the original point of Facebook? Was to was. go on and on see college, who's, yeah. who on college campus is single, you know, who's, that to me is... Who's the cute freshman kinda, coming in? Yeah, <laughs> we kind of started there, and we've, we've, you know, it's now just many different ways to do it. Obviously, social media is used for many different things, but I think uh -huh. anything that that makes easier the uh, ability to meet people. You know, Cal Newport uh, in his book, uh, The Happiness Advantage, uh -huh. talks about the activation energy required for a task. And the higher the activation energy, the uh, less likely it is you'll do something you want to get yourself to do. So he right. uses the example of like, if you want to play guitar, keep it by the couch so that when you sit down to watch the TV, oh, the guitar's there. And if it's up in the closet upstairs, yeah, and you have to go in, now the activation energy is higher, you're less likely to practice playing the guitar. And I feel like the activation energy of meeting people, when people had to go out mm -hmm. to a bar, you know, dress up, look the part, see someone across the bar, think about what they're gonna say, take the risk to get rejected yeah. in front of someone's friends or in front of their own friends, the activation energy was really high. And people, I think, whether they admit it or not, love the idea of the activation energy being really low. That I can slide into someone's DMs on Instagram and hit someone up with very minimal effort. I could be in my pajamas watching, you know, some TV show doing right. that. And I've also minimized the potential rejection from that. The rejection isn't it happening. Doesn't hurt. In, it's not happening in real time at the very least. You might have the rejection of I never got a response. But, but it it's doesn't not, hurt. Not You're quite, not looking someone in the, the eyes. Same, no. Your heart's not no. beating out of your chest. It's not real time rejection of yeah. I approached you and you're now 
being cold to me or you don't want to speak to me or you tell me you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend that's like and real time you're lying. in the do moment you, do you really have a boyfriend <laughs> right you know, how many times you go up to a girl and they say i've got a boyfriend thank you you're like you're lying to me. <laughs> i just didn't do well enough. Yeah, i know um so that that is you know we've lowered the activation yeah. energy for meeting each other and wow. that i think has saved a lot of people but what it, but it's also done something it's else. hurt a lot of us it's interrupted a little bit maybe a lot the story of attraction you know i thought about this recently how if let's say before any of this mm -hmm. there was a man who meets a woman when they're out in some social environment they exchange numbers he goes home and he has to call her right now that takes guts i have to pick up the phone i have to have a conversation and you know already i'm kind of investing if you know what I mean. Before I've even made the phone call, I'm investing because I'm thinking, what am I going to say? And how do I come across right? And how do I still my nerves? Mm -hmm. That's a form of investment. And we tend to value what we invest in. So I'm now already beginning to value this person more because I'm having to try at something. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I met her, I got her number, exchanged information, oh, and I'm thinking about the yeah. next step. And even just, by the way, the meeting someone out and exchanging numbers, there's a story already happening there. Yeah. It worked. I went over to someone and it worked. And there's a potential for something. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. She could have said no. And she didn't. And, she, and I knew and I thought I was attracted to her. And I went over there and I did the thing. And she confirmed it. And it worked. And now I have a number. And this is a story that's happening. And you go home. You think about it. Make the call. You tell your friends about it. Tell your friends. That's a form I of investment. I met this girl. you got to hear about this girl. you got to see this girl. It's a story adding to the story yeah. now you go on a date on that date you have a great time where am i going to take this person what am i going to do after the date you go home and you might have to wait three days or four days till the next date with this person and in those three or four days you may not consider it work but you are working for that person mm -hmm. there's a chasing that's going on in your mind there's an investment that's going on in your mind an, an imagination uh, the narrative that's happening and that is all part of that kind of natural courtship mm. that, that pulls us into the next stage of the interaction whether it's date two date three date four exclusivity Commitment. moving in together whatever yeah, yeah. it is now compare that with someone you know hits someone up swipes we got a match okay there's like no activation energy to that really yeah. we got a match who are they? Okay, read their tagline. <laughs> Loves, you know, <laughs> dancing Dogs. in the rain, whatever they, you know. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, so what's up? You all right? You know, you want to hang out? Then, you know, let's go for a quick drink. They get out together. He comes back or she comes back from a date to five more matches. Mm -hmm. Before he's even got time to process whether he had a good time and what was it about this person? What There's already more options coming at someone there's more or at the very least you can go home and ex explore more options from your bed that night mm -hmm. after a date so this interrupting the circuitry which will give you more dopamine which will give you more excitement yeah you're getting a, a tr uh, attracted to the novelty again right. right now not the depth of where this thing might now lead now i'm not saying that that's insurmountable and that we're just all uh, this is not me painting a picture of doom and gloom about current dating. I do think there is a toxicity, there is a toxic element to modern day dating, but it's not, I'm not defeatist about that. Mm -hmm. I just think that the impact we make on people in the time we have with them becomes that much more important. Yeah. Because you can no longer <laughs> rely on being the only person they're talking to that week or that month. They might be at five dates that week. And a hundred messages yeah. from guys. Well, around. And probably today, for a lot of people, it's less likely they're on five date this, dates this week, but they're talking to 10 people this week. Yeah. You know, they're not, a lot of people are going on fewer dates than everyone thinks. Mm. People are having a lot less sex than everyone thinks. But what's happening is there's a lot of nonsense conversations. Yeah. Superficial, you know, going nowhere, incessant 
texting conversations Crazy, right? happening. And no one's actually even just getting on the phone and talking, are they? Not unless they want to be different. Right. And that that's where it really begins to shift, is you have to be the person who's different. That takes a risk, stands out. That Yeah, well, and that that's the current question, is in a world with more noise than ever, and for all of your people out there watching right now, everything I think we talk about here in this hour, we can apply to business too. Of course. You can apply everywhere. Yeah. I get hired to go do speeches for corporates where I apply what I've learned ten, in 10 years of attraction yeah. and relationships to business because it's the same thing going on everywhere right now. There is so much noise. Everyone's talking in business too, right? It used to be that you were, you know, in a, if you were a personal trainer, you were competing with the five personal trainers on your gym floor and maybe down the street at the other local gym. And that was the, those were the people that were your competition. Yeah. Now that everyone's a fitness trainer. Now <laughs> anyone with an Instagram account and a six pack yeah. is your competition. Mm -hmm. Who's trying to sell their digital program or trying yeah. to, you know, convince people that they don't need to go to their local trainer, that I might be the other side of the world, but I've got something special for you that mm -hmm. you should do it with me. So the, the whole thing has opened up. And what that means is that you can no longer rely on just the scarcity of people to be special. I'm the only one in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you live in a small town, that someone's <clears throat> options are only limited to the radius they set their dating app to. That's it, right? right? Three, if I want to expand it out by another state, <laughs> I got a lot more options. Yeah. So it, we now can no longer rely on that. We have to be, we have to have a voice that defines us. We have to have a voice that makes us different. You know from your business. Of how many podcasters keep joining every day, every day, every day. Thousands you no longer can rely on having the, the market share simply because you're doing podcasting, no. right? You have to now be a voice that's different. Why are people, people only have so many hours in a week, right? This is a, a long form podcast. It's, you know, the interview's an hour or so on. Why are people gonna sit with their limited mm -hmm. hours and listen to my hour instead of these other six or 10 top podcasters, because we can't listen to them all. Right. So now your voice matters. And in dating, our voice matters, because mm. it's not enough anymore to just be a viable dating option for someone. But do people even really want to stand out to have a committed long-term relationship? Or are they more just, they say they want the commitment, but their actions don't back it with just constantly, um, being surface level or constantly being a part of the noise as opposed to trying to stand out. It's like they might try to, especially with guys, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. maybe it seems like more women want to be committed than more guys want to be committed. I, well, that's a tricky one. I, most people I believe who think they are evolved enough for a relationship are not. Right. And when do you know for a you long time, by the way, I count myself in that category where <laughs> I too. thought I was, too, man. I really thought there were times in my life where I really thought I was a great, I was a great guy. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, a, I was a, it wasn't that I was ever a nasty person. I was never a mean person. I was never a, but I wasn't the great partner I thought I was. It's mm -hmm. not like I, you know. There are times in my life where I thought, God, I'm just, I'd just be a great partner to someone. And I was not ready to be a great partner to someone because I think the first time you really give yourself to something, really commit yourself to not just your own happiness and your own needs, because that's what most people talk about when mm. they talk about a relationship is their needs, their happiness, right? How good it feels to be in a relationship. It's about them. But it's not about seeing someone else, truly seeing someone mm -hmm. else and understanding who they are and understanding what their needs are and supporting them and their happiness and their it goals. It's a great relationship when you stop thinking about your needs and you just say, I'm gonna give this person and, and look at them from a place of understanding and wanna bring them so much joy and fulfillment and 
not expecting a return, but hopefully the other person is saying the same thing to, to, about you? Well, yes and no. The, there's a lot of, there are a lot of people who on that idea, that ethos, have lived a very masochistic life for a long time. Really? That, by the way, you, what you just described could describe one of two things. One beautiful, one terrible. Uh -huh. What you just described could either be an extraordinary relationship of two givers, or it could describe unrequited love. Mm. It could describe the person who is giving, 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 giving to someone and playing the martyr in their own relationship. They keep ignoring me. They keep, you know, not meeting my needs. They keep being selfish. They keep, but I am just going to show up <laughs> and be my the best, best partner. <laughs> and love them and give my all. And one day they will turn around to meet me mm, in that. Right. Many, many people have, have, caused tremendous suffering to themselves and and wasted a lot of good years. So is it both give to yourself, that. make sure you're asking for what you need, but also giving? It's, I, it's a combination of respecting what your core needs are. What, what do I need? Like when it really comes down to it, what's my standard for what I need? Now, how exactly someone meets that standard is that's where the messiness of relationships comes in. Because you say, I want to be respected, and then someone does something and you go, I don't feel respected, but they go, but that doesn't mean a lack of respect to right. me. So now we have a whole conversation on the execution of a standard. Oh my gosh. And different definitions of what meets that standard. That's, that's where the confusion comes in. And that's where we have to have some really loving, cooperative conversations to figure out am i you know am i being this is one of the hardest parts of a relationship am i being reasonable in asking for what i'm asking for or is this my insecurity speaking oh wow you know am i which one is talking and sometimes we're so close we don't even know that's the danger that's by the way i see one of the most valuable jobs i can do for people in my work is not to be a smarter voice than they are because people, people can be great. They can, when it comes to their friends or people around them or whatever, they can be very smart. But to be an objective voice outside of their drunken haze, because mm -hmm. we're so close to something, we get, we, we're, we're not sober. And now we don't have logical answers to questions because someone's, we get to the point where we're arguing about something, I don't even know if I'm right. I don't know if the thing I'm saying is, is if I'm being the insecure one or, or if I'm being the reasonable one. And sometimes we leave a situation and we go, God, I was insecure. And sometimes we leave and we go, I can't believe I let someone convince me I was crazy. Right. They, like, they were the one that was doing the wrong thing and they convinced me that I was nuts. So how do we step out of that emotional feeling where we're feeling overwhelmed or disrespected or hurt or sad or like, the relationship didn't meet an expectation mm. or communication was off and we're in it and we're communicating and we're both frustrated. How do you step out and look at it from a different point of view so that you just don't keep repeating that conversation over and over? I mean, don't hurt it further. Yeah. I, I think there's a, we have to have a really healthy combination of always questioning ourselves and, and saying, where is this coming from for me? And would it really hurt me to, compromise on this standard mm -hmm. is is would it be the more loving thing to do to understand this about my partner but in order to that that needs to be combined with a, a simultaneous respect for ourselves and what we need and to I think go to a situation and say okay I want to be the most understanding compassionate loving partner I can be who doesn't inhibit or limit my partner who supports them wants them to do great but I also need to recognize that um, it's not, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. I need to be the person that can um, be understanding, what was I saying? Be understanding of my partner. You want to be the most understanding of someone else. But you also have to know your own needs. Be understanding of someone else, but, oh, that's right. 
I need to be the person that is understanding of the needs of my partner and what they want. But at the same time, um, love, what was it? Love's my, I need to be understanding of my partner's needs. Ah, that was it. I need to be understanding of my partner's needs, but the context of me being super compassionate and understanding needs to be that I am, um, that this is happening in a loving environment where my partner wants to be my teammate. Mm -hmm. If we're in a situation where our partner isn't showing empathy for us and isn't tr like, if you feel they're not trying to, that we're always coming to that side, that's a problem. That's tough. That's a problem. There should be seeing, I see where you're coming from as well, type of energy and communication. Right? Exactly. Not just, I'm not getting what I want. You did this wrong. You need to feel you have a teammate. Yeah. And a lot of people feel like they're constantly being understanding, but they don't have a teammate on the other side. I'm constantly trying to grow and understand your position, but I don't feel the same from your side. That then becomes a problem. How do you have a conversation so that it switches or it becomes more of a equal partnership and teammate? If you feel like you're the only one being on the team, mm. how do you get the other person? I think we need to communicate a lot about what, about the spirit of the relationship. You know what I mean? Like not keeping score. Yeah. Like pride is a very hard thing to give up in a relationship because we become competitive often very quickly when we feel threatened, when we feel vulnerable, when we feel our partner's done something to hurt us. Now I'm, now how do I score a point or how do I, right. and that's, that's a just, once you get into that cycle, it's like you're just, it, it spirals. It has to, one person has to be prepared to break that cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that game. And I do believe that we have to love the way we want to be loved. And we have to constantly educate our partner on what it is to love. Not from an arrogant place, but we're all in, a, in a sense, both partners are always educating each other by you do something I don't like. And if I have a loving, compassionate response to that, I'm also showing you what I want this to be in reverse. Mm -hmm. When I do something you don't like, right? Here's the response I want. I'm not, not attacking you. Not a game playing response, not a, you know, like if you see a partner, you're in the early stages of relationship and you feel your partner was really flirting with someone over there having a conversation about something that made you feel uncomfortable, but from a loving place and from a kind place and from a place of that made me feel, you know, it, it hurt me to, to see yeah. that and not, I'm going to blame you and I'm going to do this. I'm going to get angry, but that, you know, that made me feel uncomfortable. Bringing an energy like that. Most people aren't used to that mm -hmm. in a relationship. We're not used to that standard of communication. We're used to doing something and then someone attacks us. Reacting. We, yeah, exactly. So I think it's educate, we're constantly educating. What's it gonna take for us to not react to a situation where we feel hurt or like we, our expectation wasn't met from our partner and come from that place? God, it's Be so difficult. Because why, why do we react so much? Some, sometimes it's just space. Like how I need to take a, a moment to to process something so that I can say, I can have a more evolved response. And not react. It's funny, I've been, you know, the relationship I've been in, uh, which is newer in the last five months, I wanna talk about something right away and address it. She doesn't wanna talk. She wants to have space so she doesn't react. Yeah. So she, she's, and she'll say like, I don't wanna get angry at you. I don't wanna yell at you. That's mm -hmm. not the type of person I wanna be. So I'd rather just not talk. And then I'm in limbo and I'm like, oh, I, just wanna, I just want to like get to resolve this thing. It. Let's at least communicate and then we can move on as opposed to holding on to something yeah. for half a day or, or a few hours. Yeah. Sp I, I, that, here's the thing. Space is easy when you get a text you don't like, you know, or when you <laughs> see something you don't like from afar and, and uh -huh. you're not going to see that person for a few hours or till tomorrow. Now you have space to go through you know, I'm angry, you know, I'm really, really angry, I'm upset, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I feel rejected, I don't feel enough, I, you know, you can kind of cycle through those and then have a couple of sensible conversations with people whose opinions you respect. You and I have 
<laughs> yeah, we'll be sit like, down. it's not that big a deal. Yeah, Take you a break. Sit down, you go, okay, this thing, I'm feeling this, and I'm hurt, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm that, and you have a couple of smart voices, yeah. either that come from in here, which is hard to do, which is very hard to get that objectivity, and or that come, you know, from just one or two people whose opinions you really respect, who aren't going to tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. Who aren't going to tell you you're so right to be to feel that way? Get you're, angry. You yeah. need someone who is brave enough and close enough to you, and smart enough sometimes to recognize. You, I'm concerned that you're overreacting to this, mm -hmm. and that this this reaction is not going to serve you. Yeah. And that I think you need to bring this energy to the conversation. That is extremely valuable. What's hard is when you get information in real time and you're with the person, and you're in the same room, and now you're dealing with trying to process and create that, you know, okay, I need to, I'm trying to get to a more positive place here, yeah. while being asked to communicate in real time. Well, real time elicits reflex responses, and reflex responses are often very harmful to a relationship. It's the, um, reflex responses are often based on instinct, yeah. and instinct is it's very, wrong. very dangerous. <laughs> It False so, instinct. We're yeah. so often told, you know, trust your instincts. And that's just not often great advice. If you're not emotionally intelligent and if, you haven't, if you're jealous all the time, then having a jealous instinct isn't necessarily the best thing. But some of these instincts are kind of hardwired, right? We're, what we're doing with a lot of our better nature is overcoming certain programming that we have. You know, in a riptide, you get pulled out to sea. Your instinct tells you in that moment to swim back to shore against the current. Mm -hmm. Ignore the riptide, I just need to get back to shore. Which is stronger, you or the current? The current. And it will drown you. You will exhaust <laughs> and drown before you get back. True. So. Until it washes job. you to shore, just like dead. Right, so in that moment, fighting harder, oh won't save you. Thinking clearer will. And thinking more clearly means I need to swim sideways. I need to swim parallel. Let it take me out, swim further, or be swim parallel, because I've actually, I'm giving myself a, further, a longer journey. But then when I'm out of the current, then I can swim back to shore. Yeah, that's true. Now that's not, instinct won't get you to do that, because that requires thinking clearly. Instinct will drown you in that moment. And in a relationship, in dating, your instincts will get you killed. That's true. You know, your instinct says, a woman goes on a date with a guy and has a great time, and says, your instinct says, clear the calendar for the next three months. We found it. Right. <laughs> we did it, guys. We had an clear, amazing night. Clear the schedule. We were connected on every level. He's awesome. We have a great connection. Clear the calendar. This is what we're doing now. Wow. Even if, I'm not even saying someone who hates the rest of their life. You can like your job and still be so caught up in the chemical rush of this was amazing that this is all you want to do now, mm -hmm. right? Well, this isn't good for what you want to happen here. What do you want to happen? Well, you want to get to know this person better, spend more time with them, invest at an organic pace based on the level of investment that's going on, right? Mm. Thing I've said for years, don't invest in someone based on how much you like them. Invest on based on how much they invest in you. Mm. But people don't do that. People invest on instinct. I really like them. And my investment is proportionate to how much I like them, not how much I'm seeing there's a mutual investment. Did I tell you about the castle? What castle? All right, this is, you're gonna like this. So I was thinking about this whole idea of investment. <clears throat> like buying a castle? Well, that's the thing. You can't buy a castle for a relationship. I See, to mm. me, the relationship <clears throat> is the castle, right? When you meet someone and you have a connection, because I'm always, I'm, you know me, I do seminars all over the world. We have thousands of women come and join us. And the thing that, there's always someone who puts their hand up and says, it starts the story with, Matt, I have this incredible connection with this guy. So they're already in a now relationship? Now I know, no, no, just dating. no, often not. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know, now I know we have a problem when someone's justifying whatever they're about to say next 
with what an incredible connection they have with someone. Mm -hmm. An incredible connection is like, you meet someone, you connect and you have a great plot of land. This plot of land could be great because it's in the middle of a forest, could be great because it's on the cliffs overlooking the ocean. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place to build. That's the connection. Still just a connection, but it's still just a plot of land. Mm. All right? Let's see it for what it is. It's potential. Yeah. It's still just a plot of land. Now what you need is two builders, two people who are going to build something here. And that requires two people who show up each day and lay brick after brick after brick after brick and slowly but surely create a castle. Most people have the experience of someone who joins them on that plot of land and they both look at it and they're like, isn't this great? Look at the ocean. This, this is great. Look at the view we have here. Look at the trees. Look at the, This is amazing. And they get real excited. Now, one of them might be willing to build. One of them mm. might be a builder. The other one might just really like the potential of this plot of land. And then you have someone who's there building every day. They're doing the investment. I have mm -hmm. the woman come to me who's building and a guy who's left the construction site. <laughs> I don't know where he is. He's at home, he's binge watching his favorite show, he's out on another, he's looking at another plot of land, wow. you know? And then three weeks later he calls in and says, he, you know, he sends a text to her after three weeks of ghosting her or just disappearing or just patchy communication and says, thinking of you. That's a builder who started building, then left the building site for three weeks and called him from home and went, how's the castle going? Wow. Meanwhile, she's over there building the castle on her own. You can't build on your own. And the problem we have right now is there are too many people who value the connection instead of the castle. Castle is where it's at. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a true builder, who over time is gonna build. That's, that's what's a, a relationship is a castle. This is why love at first sight is bullshit to me. Doesn't work. I can't, it's <clears> just <throat> whatever. It takes time. It's, all, it's infatuation. It's, you, she's hot, he's hot. <laughs> you know, there, there's some connection there that's based on the fact you like this and I like this. Oh my God, we're supposed to be together. This is only part of the equation. You, a castle becomes a castle because two people work on it and it becomes, unique and ornate and there are secret passageways mm -hmm. only the two of you know about and mm -hmm. there's an argument that knocks down a wall and then you build it up and fortify that wall Interesting. and it makes it even stronger and you know the the weather over time weathers the stone on the castle in a unique way that makes it your castle there's other castles in the world but this one is uniquely yours it's been built by the two of you it's been hard won you know that's a relationship that's why you know a 20 year relationship or marriage or a 30 year relationship or marriage is, is special. It's because two people have had to go through hmm. shit together. Yeah. They've done things together. They, this isn't fantasy. This isn't building a castle in the sky. Mm. The idea of love, the idea of what we could be, the one day wager, I call it the one day wager, the one day, I'm making a wager that one day you'll be what I want you to be. Mm. One day you'll, you'll invest in me the way I want you to. One day you'll change. The one day wager is the most dangerous wager you can possibly make in your wow. love life. The real shit is what's going on now. Yeah. Is someone trying? Do they want to be here? Are they focused on the little shit, not just the big shit? Because anyone can go and have a, like people say, but when, we're, when it's great, is the great. Amazing, yeah. When we go, like, we go, we've been on some amazing dates, or we, we did vacation. that vacation. <laughs> we had the best time. It was amazing. Of course, you were on fucking vacation. Yeah. Anyone can go to Disney World and have a great time. It's Disney World, right? That's the it's the job yeah. of the place is to make sure you have a great time no matter who you're with. Right. Right. But you know what? When I was 13, I had a, like, I, when I was, I think I was 12 or 13, my parents took me to America for the first time. Mm. And we came to Florida, and where do you think we went? We went to Disneyland. Disney <laughs> and I was massively excited, you know? 
I was I was Pumped. so excited. I was excited to be in America. I was excited to see the things I'd seen on TV. Uh -huh. Excited to see the references to movies I'd seen. Excited for the rides. We go into Disney World and I learned something very interesting about myself there. This is going to sound profound for a trip to mm, Disney World. At but 13, yeah. I, but I realized something about myself. Because of course I go in there, it's magical, it's... Oh my God, this is crazy, it's you huge. Taking a photo with Mickey. You or, go on Space yeah. Mountain, yeah. You, yeah, there's Mickey there. There's all these dazzling attractions. But it was something that stood out to me, even more than Space Mountain, even more than the big ride. And it was the trash cans. Oh yeah. On some level, that maybe I couldn't fully articulate at that age. I saw the trash cans and I was moved by it. Mm -hmm. I said, someone cared enough about this place to theme the trash cans. Yeah. The trash can in Tomorrowland is a futuristic trash can. The trash can in, you mm -hmm. know, Indiana Jones Land or whatever it's called is a tiki right. bamboo trash can. The trash cans were different depending on where you were. It's amazing. Someone cared so much <laughs> about the detail of that world that they styled and themed the trash cans. It moved me. Yeah. I've never forgotten that. Wow. The trash cans in life. <laughs> and I've thought about that endlessly in my business. Mm. When I do retreat, I just got back from my retreat and you know, someone came, I told this story on the retreat, someone came to me at the end of the retreat because of all the little details we put on the retreat, you know, the mm. little, it's not just a, it's not just a seminar and event, yeah. it's we hold parties and inside it's those. Experience. And yeah. It's an immersive world. It's like, it, it, it's, it's, we like to think we've created the immersive theater of the self-development world. Mm -hmm. And I, someone came up to me at the end of this retreat and said, you achieved trash can status mm. and it that's big the 13 year old in me wanted to cry wow, that's amazing right and it it moved me again and i and i thought that's what i want and i'm i thought about this even today as i was coming here and i was like you know what this absolutely applies to relationships too often in a you know in a breakup, often when people are going through difficult times with their partner or whatever, mm -hmm. the thing they go back to is, but we had that amazing trip. But we had those amazing times. They, they go to these highlights. They go to the space mountain of their relationship. They go, oh, but remember when we met Mickey? It's that, yeah. right? The, the meeting Mickey moment of their relationship. But relationships are about the trash cans, man the trash cans yeah because guess what in a day at Disney you ride Space Mountain once maybe it's, twice how many times moment. do you use the trash cans every day all the time every 20 minutes every 30 yeah. minutes it's the trash cans and what will define your relationship is the trash cans not Space Mountain mm, the lower moments the, the, the messy moments, moments. That, that are barely noticeable uh -huh. the moments the, the micro attractions. Mm. The moment where we do something sweet, where we think of our partner when we didn't need to, and we worry about the, the day they had or support them or even just support them silently or in private, you know, or support them by what we don't bring to them. Yeah. Or, it's that, it's the detail, it's the detail. And that's what's gonna determine how great your life is. And my concern is, and we've all been there, my concern is the number of people out there who are staying in the wrong thing because of the space mountain of the relationship. The few moments that were magical. Or they're spending too much time grieving the loss of the wrong thing because all they remember is space mountain. Interesting. But they, don't, they don't think of how shitty the trash cans were. And the trash cans, that's the stuff. That's the day to day. Yeah. How good was it day to day? This is the difference between being in love and being happy. Mm. What is the difference? 
between love and happiness. You can be in love and be really unhappy. Be suffering inside and be in love. You can have constant be in love and be having a relationship that's causing you constant anxiety, constant heartache, constant pain, feeling overlooked, not feeling important. You can be in love and all of those things still be true. How crazy is that? We think that love is this thing where it's like, it's rational, like I'm gonna love, I'm gonna be in love with this person who brings me joy. Not true. And we need to start worrying more about happiness. Because if someone isn't building with you, if someone isn't committing to actually building the castle with you, mm -hmm. that's the quality of your life. Yeah. Not how in love you are. You might love certain things about them. You might have loved the date you went on. You might have loved the, the Her, Space Mountain. or the, Certain characteristics they the had. The sex was incredible. How charming they were. How charismatic, how whatever. It didn't, but maybe, it doesn't mean that you're happy day to day. It's a mm -hmm. big difference, right? When do you know, I love this analogy, and it made me want to ask you about when do you know you're ready for a committed, intimate relationship? When do you know you're ready for it, as opposed to you just feel alone and you want to have someone in your life? I guess when, and, you're, when you're ready to build. So when you're ready to build. When it's not you're going there because the fantasy of it all is exciting to you. But when you're actually ready to build. And, and that doesn't mean that you're not looking... See, the castle analogy is, is cool because when we were talking earlier about this idea of giving without expectation. Well, you, you do expect something in a relationship, right? Yeah. It's yeah. overly simplistic. We do expect things. We expect respect. Mm -hmm. as loyalty, defined on whatever terms loyalty means to us. Yeah. Love, appreciation, all of that. To be seen, we have a lot of expectations in a relationship. So it's not a relationship where we just, we give without expectation. But that to me is where the building thing is really interesting to me. Because you want to work damn hard as a builder yeah. in your relationship. But you want someone else who's building too. Right? That's where the expectation comes in. I'm going to, I'm going to, work hard to build this thing and I'm going to build it at a really high standard. Mm. I'm not going to look at your work and go, well, if you missed out <laughs> some of the grouting there, then I'm going to, you know, like skip it on my end. No, this is my standard. Yeah. I'm going to build to a really high standard. What if the person you've been with for a year isn't building to your standard? That's, that's a conversation. That's a real conversation. Like, here's what I need. Here's the kind of relationship I want to have. When do you start to just say, well, it's okay if they do half the job that I do? Is the, jo is the job they're doing half-assed one you really need them to do well? Or is it one that can be done half-assed? You know? Sometimes right. I think that there are certain things we let go in a relationship. That's where the compromise comes in. That's where the sacrifice comes in. There are certain things I'm okay with you not doing as well as I once thought yeah, I yeah, needed yeah. someone to do them. Man, I thought this thing was really important. It's not. It's not that important. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> so what are we doing? Yeah. I'm not worried. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, and we've all done that. We've all seen those things that once were important to us and we let them, we said, you know what, this, I was at an age where I thought that was really important and it's no longer as important or significant as I made it. And then there are things that never stop being important or they become more important. You know, the ability to communicate well. I think as you get older, those things become more important. Yeah. The ability for someone to have genuine empathy, to the the ability for someone in let's say an argument to to not jump to saying a spiteful thing mm -hmm. that's hard to then forget. Someone who doesn't try and do damage in an argument but tries to build, tries to figure out. Let's figure this out together. Yeah. We may both be hurt, but let's come to this in a loving way. When you're younger, you say shit that's just mean, hurtful, because you're hurt. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And then you realize, oh God, three months later, they still remember that comment, even though they said they forgot it. And they hold on to it. They still, they, they still have that in their head. I'm not doing that again. There's certain things that I think as you get older, hopefully if we mature, we start to see these are the, this is the important stuff. <clears throat> what do you think are the, I didn't prep you on this before, but what do you think are the three or five components to a foundation of a relationship that has the potential to really thrive long-term, committed for decades. What are like, 
it needs to have these three or these five things. Otherwise, it's going to be really challenging to be to sustain this type of love and joy and happiness. I mean, a couple of simple ones, I guess, are I need to I need to show up for my partner in ways that they need me to, not just ways that are comfortable to me. Mm -hmm. We, in other words, pay attention to what your partner actually needs, because it's really easy to say, you know. I'm going to bring them lunch every day. That's that's like I I'm a really good cook and I'm really you know I want to slave away every morning to bring them lunch every day because you know that's me giving. Maybe they don't. They don't care. Bring lunch every day. <clears throat> like maybe they don't care. Maybe what would mean the most to them is you them getting home and you really being interested in their day. Mm -hmm. Do you think lo uh, love languages is an important part of this, where it's like understanding someone's love language and giving them? Their top yeah, priorities. Yeah, I think I think it's I think that it's an interesting framework, and it's yeah. been for a lot of people a very successful framework. Mm -hmm. um, I think any framework that just allows you to kind of, you know, create a little a structure for things yeah. that gives you some simplicity around it is can be valuable. Sure. You know, and it doesn't mean it's the only framework you can apply, but it, right. it's a valuable model to mm -hmm. work from. So it's showing up in so, ways that so they need. So showing up in ways, yeah, not what do I want to give, mm -hmm. but what do they actually need And I think that's a, lot of, that's a lot of conflict in relationships because, I, and I think you need to understand, do I want to do something that's uncomfortable every day that's not foreign to me, or that's foreign to me, mm. or do I want to find a partner that enjoys the things that I like to give? Well, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. I, you know, so and probably be any relationship is going to be a bit of both, but sometimes uh -huh. it works even without, like, that's a kind of compatibility issue. Yes. But I think it even works outside of that in day to day stuff. Because you might say, the thing I want to give to my partner is an awesome, you know, night together. But maybe what they need is an awesome night with their friends. Yeah. And the, maybe the most loving thing you can do is say, hey, I know you haven't seen this person in a while. You should go and see them. I know that relationship is important to you. Mm -hmm. You should go and hang out with your mum tonight. Or, you know, recognizing not what's easy for me to give, but what might be less comfortable for me to give, but is actually what would mean the world to them. Yeah. And, and I think if you really want to make yourself irreplaceable to someone, it's recognizing that. Mm. Because no one else is going to do that for them. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's, they, At some maybe, level, but yeah. it's really rare to find someone who who is willing to do that for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the number one. The second thing <clears throat> is to work on yourself. Yep. And to say, I'm responsible for me. My partner isn't responsible for me. I need to do the work to be the most loving, confident person I can be in this world. What, what are the... Fulfilled, mm -hmm. has their own purpose, has things that drive them. Mm. That, to me, is very, very important. If what's the first thing people should do to do work on themselves? Because you, you threw a few things out there, but what's like... I mean, firstly, do you have... Maybe here's an interesting question you can ask yourself. If I had 10 hours free right now, what would I do with them? Interesting. If you can't give a good answer to that question, you might already be describing one of the weaknesses of your relationship. Yeah. And binge watching a series is not the no, best use of your time. It's, you know... That, if, if the answer is, oh my God, well, I have my purpose, the thing I love getting stuck into, or it doesn't even have to be some grand purpose. Not everyone has found like their life's calling, but it could be, oh, I really want to learn this language, or I really want to see this friend, or I really want to go and, you know, whatever it is, read this book or learn this thing. Take care of my health. Yeah, yeah. I want to, oh, I can't wait to get to the gym. I, if you should be able to answer the question of, my partner canceled on me today, mm -hmm. what would I do with that day now? And if you can't, that, then you're, you begin to describe the person who's sitting there waiting for their partner to text them, waiting for their partner to make them feel good enough. And that's not attractive. It's not, and it's not fair to our partners. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And, and by the way, people put a lot of pressure on their partners by expecting their partner to put a Band-Aid on all sorts of things for them. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're feeling like, we, we, there's a, a lot of rhetoric about vulnerability right now. Now, I think vulnerability is huge. I think the work that people like Brene Brown are doing and so on is huge. Right. It's massively important. Vulnerability is absolutely an act of courage and we should encourage it more, both sexes all the time. But 
his vulnerability is something's making me insecure and I'm, I'm going to share it with you because you're my partner and I love you and I tell you things, right? But you don't want to do that every day, It goes beyond vulnerability right? if an hour from now I tell you, oh God, I'm feeling insecure again. <laughs> and then an hour from now you go, that thing's affecting me again. Yeah. And this tonight, because now in a way what we're doing is instead of sharing, we're dumping. Mm. I'm asking you now to fix it for me, to put a band-aid on it for Make me. Make me feel better, yeah. Of course, it's part of our part. A loving partner will support you and will do everything in their power to make you feel loved and to make you feel safe and to make you feel secure. And it's absolutely true that sometimes what we're feeling as insecurity is because our partner isn't doing their job yeah, in those things. That's true, they're not right? building. They're not building. They're, they're doing things that are proactively mm. making us feel insecure. There's minor betrayals, yeah. minor neglects, uh, all of that. But sometimes we have to say, okay, what part of my, what part of this am I responsible for? And it's my, it's my partner's responsibility. It's our part, responsibility in life together to share, mm -hmm. to share the load, to work towards things together. But it's not your job to carry the load for me. Mm -hmm to carry my problems, to put the band-aid on every day. I need to- Maybe once in a blue moon, yeah. Of course, of course, and, we, and yeah. we're all gonna do that. We're yeah, all gonna course. have like, we're, we're gonna have days, weeks, times where we're going through something really serious. Mm -hmm. And our partner's job is to show up, Yeah. you know? But a friend of mine who's kind of blunt said to me, some days or weeks, you get to be needy and difficult and high maintenance and boring and you know, insecure and then you don't <laughs> and i thought yeah like we get to be those things for a time mm -hmm. until we don't until it gets too much for somebody else because we need to be at, le at the very least we need to show our partner we're committed to our own growth yeah so the you know the first one what did we have <clears throat> uh, show, show up in ways they need not just ways you want to show up the second one's uh work on yourself yep um, I think, I guess the third one, it, to me, teamwork is everything. Like mm -hmm. being a genuine team is huge. Really looking at each other as teammates, as opposed to you're there to meet my needs or I'm competing with you in Gosh. some way. Man, I've done that before. Like we're an actual team. I, and I saw, you know, one of the things I loved most about Chris Rock's recent stand-up, Tambourine. I haven't seen it yet. Such a genius name. The whole concept is, you know, about the idea that he couldn't, in his last marriage, play the tambourine. He couldn't play the, <laughs> the backup instrument, right? Right. <clears throat> and, and I thought it was such a great, great uh, metaphor. Because in a in a good relationship, in a, in a really genuinely mutually supportive relationship, the, some days you play tambourine. Some days you're their teammate. You, you can't, he, you know, the way he says it, her success is your success and vice versa. You're in this together. You, and, and some days that person's the, the, the lead and you're, you're on tambourine. And a lot of people have never learned how to play tambourine. Mm. You know, there's the other thing, I don't know, I remember where it comes from, but every relationship has a, a flower and a gardener, right? Well, I don't, most people don't want to be in a relationship where they're always the gardener. And they want to be never the flower, the flower, right? Blooming all the time. Yes, and sometimes you have to be the gardener. No matter how long you've played the flower, right? Right. You and I have played flowers a lot in our lives, right? Sure. We've been used to being a certain you know, having a leader role and having these kind of big lives and big worlds and whatever. And then you go to a relationship and the relationship doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? About you. No. Yeah. I don't care you that you're, you're the, the you know, that you're the flower out there in the world. Sometimes in our relationship, you have to be the gardener. Sometimes you've got to play tambourine, even if to everyone else, you are the, the constant flower, yeah. right? Movie reference, constant gardener. Well, you can't, <laughs> you can't be the constant flower, right? You, can't, you might be in your business in right. some way, but- In but a relationship is different. You can't, now you're coming as two equals. Mm. And so it's, so much of it's checking your own 
damn ego and being like, I'm in this to, to be with you as a teammate. Not this or this, this. When you know you found your match for life or your potential match for life, or you think this could be the match. By the way, these are much harder questions than the first interview we did together. <laughs> I know. You know um, is it when you see these three things after a period of time and you feel convinced that the, the, the bricks are being laid equally in a certain well, I, way? Yeah. Like when, when, well, you I think say, when you say, I'm ready to, to be committed all in. I, I think there are four, four stages um, to a relationship. Okay. Stage one. Stage one is admiration. <laughs> That's when you don't have a relationship with this person. You admire, like, I look at you, you. And I, I look at you and I'm like, this person's hot. They have something about them. Uh -huh. I like their qualities. I like their energy. They have a good potential. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, that doesn't even mean they have good potential for you right now. It just means this is a p person of high potential in you, some way. You admire them. Yeah. The second stage is connection. Mm -hmm. And you could, I think, in, that, in a sense, connection and chemistry are both relevant to this stage because you have this person where there's a mutual like i like things about you you like things about me i think you're attractive you think i'm attractive we share some common ideas common grounds in life our outlook whatever and beliefs yeah yeah uh, that could be found on a great date right doesn't really mean much still mm -hmm. this is the plot of land yeah you can have great sex there'd be chemistry you can make out all night None of this means you're going to have a great relationship. Okay. The third stage is commitment. That says, I want to do this with you. I am committed to building with you. And you are committed to building with me. Mm. Right? That's a really great stage to be at. It's very important. Right? It's, you can't have a relationship without that. Any relationship without that or where that's one-sided is unrequired love yeah. by definition. Mm -hmm. And there are a ton of people out there right now who say, I'm just, you know, I, I created a program recently called Attraction to Commitment, which literally dealt with why people keep getting stuck in limbo. Yeah. Why they keep getting stuck in the casual phases and it never gets to a relationship. And one of the things that fascinates me is how long we stay with something that's just casual, that isn't a real relationship on the hope that it will change. Mm. Um, unrequited love, you know, certainly unrequited commitment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a nice time when you're like 23, right? Right. <laughs> That's stage three. Stage uh -huh. four is compatibility. Mm, man. And the hard thing I think for a lot of people is, I used to question this one myself, like if, you know, the idea love conquers all, right? It doesn't. It does not. I wish. I like it. I like that phrase. It's an amazing... I love the phrase. I love the sentiment of it. It's an amazing bumper sticker, you know? And there's nothing, you know, what is more powerful in the world than, than love. And it, all you need is love? Yeah, it's not apparently, true. <laughs> apparently not. It's not true. We need a little more. It, you can have love without commitment, right? And you can have, you can have commitment without compatibility. Interesting. And this is where things get... I used to think, well, maybe commitment is enough and maybe issues with compatibility can be overcome as long as two people are truly committed to each other. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't believe that anymore. I, I think that it goes beyond commitment. To, to truly <clears throat> last, you have to have two people who are really compatible. Like, okay, let's say we got commitment. Two people want to be together. They admire each other. They have chemistry. Right. They're, they say, I'm committed to you. But one person's sex drive is here. And the other ones is here. Not compatible. This is going to be difficult. Right? One person likes to spend a lot of money. Another person wants to save all the money. Right. One person believes in a certain religion. Another person doesn't believe in that. One person, you know, wants to spend five days a week together. The other person is happy with one night a week together. One person wants their family to move in. The other person wants their space. <laughs> right. <laughs> These are serious, serious issues that often end relationships. And so... To me, you want to say what, how do you know when you found your match? All four. Four stages. All I go, four. I admire this person. We have connection and chemistry. We have genuine mutual commitment and we're compatible. How do you know if 
that you're fully compatible or somewhat compatible? And is there a spectrum of what's possible? Yeah, that, I mean, I, I wrestled with that for, for years <laughs> myself is, you we're know, compatible here, but not here. And can we overcome this yeah. incompatibility here? Is it, it goes back to, is it one of my deal breakers? Is it really important yeah. to me? Or can I let up here? And does the other person understand the sacrifice I'm making in letting up there? And do they show An appreciation, appreciation for, for it? And do they, you know, do they see me for that compromise that I'm making? Or do they just expect you should do it easily? Yeah. You just, well, you should have. <laughs> that's the way I am, so that's the way you should be. Right. Yeah, and, and to me, again, part of growing up is realizing I wasn't always right. I was... You know, there were things that I used to, you know, I, I've looked at ways that I've been in relationships in my past where I did something and I just so thought I was in the right and so took for granted what someone else was doing for me, the way that they were being forgiving, understanding, mm -hmm. and just completely took that for granted, you know? And I think, man, I mean, you know, you talk about we were four years ago, we were together on this. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest difference in my life? Being fucking humbled. <laughs> you know? How so? Oh God, in so many ways. In so many ways. Thinking you had it figured out in one way, but realizing that there was a lot of growth still. Thinking you wouldn't experience this kind of pain or worry or anxiety or fear. And then, oh, it turns out that I can feel that too. And those people who used to use the, that I used to hear using the word anxiety, um, who I used to think, why is everyone fucking wrong, talking dude? about anxiety? <laughs> like, what is wrong like with everyone? Oh shit. Yeah. The, the ways that you realize you're not, that you're, you're more vulnerable than you thought, that mistakes you thought you'd never make, you made. You make, yeah. You said where well, everyone else's mistakes. Oh man, yeah. And then you make them. Things that were going well for you for a long time and then all of a sudden didn't go as well and you thought they were just always going to go well. There's all sorts of things. You go, man. And that to me is what, as you get older, you hopefully, hopefully, you, you know, Socrates said the mark of an educated man is, is someone who has some awareness of how little they know. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, every year I realize how little I know. Yeah. Less, more and more I realize how much I don't know. <laughs> and... That has just, it's made me better. Yeah. It's made me better, it's made me more forgiving, it's made me more empathetic, it's made me less judgmental, it's made me a better coach, mm -hmm. a better speaker. Not to be so sure of myself about wow. everything all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, she doesn't always make for great Instagram quotes. Because <laughs> you got to be. Know thing, yeah. I know. I know. If I know one thing, yeah. I know this. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah. Maybe I feel I know less now than I did five years ago, and maybe that's a good thing. It is a good thing. I think humility is a good thing. Yeah. We all need it at times. I'm curious for all the women who come to your retreats, who are suffering. They deeply want this love, this connection, this compatibility, commitment. They want all these things that we're talking about. Mm. And they feel like they've been struggling for years. They've done the dating apps. They've gone on hundreds of dates. For all the people at your retreats or the women who are watching or listening at home that just want to find their match, their partner, what's the first step they can take to start getting out of the weeds of like failure after failure mm. and start seeing some progress to greater potential matches or... A couple of things. I mean, firstly, uh, there's a guy called John Kay who wrote a book called Obliquity. And the whole idea of the book was obliquity is when you reach goals through indirect means. So if you take building a business, you're far more like, if, if, you're, if your goal is to make money, instead of focusing on mm -hmm. making money, mm -hmm. focus on all the things that provide value to people. Yeah. Because the making money part will be the byproduct. Right. If you focus on, I need to get rich, I need to get rich, I need to get rich, you're probably not going to do the things that are going to get you rich. Right. Because what makes you financially wealthy? The relationships you take time to build, that often for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. you don't ask for anything, you don't even care to, you're just building, you, you know, the 
products that you create for no reason than you just think that they're great or that you think they have value or whatever the service that you provide people. It's just, it's not, what's the quickest way for me to make money? Uh, most people like that don't get rich. Right. In a relationship, there's all these things that build a relationship that really have nothing to, that don't feel like they have anything to do with a relationship. Like who would say, knowing what you would do with the next 10 hours of your life, if it was free, is actually gonna be a huge determinant of the health of your relationship. Mm. It's like one's over here and one's over here. Right. Right? Shouldn't we be talking about how to have better sex? Yeah. Shouldn't we be talking about how to communicate well with my partner? No, we're talking about you being an independently attractive, purpose-driven, independent person who is attractive just to watch Mm. from afar because of the life you lead. That's gonna lead to a much better relationship. By the way, even that will lead to better sex. Yeah. Because your partner looks at you and is like, this person, more attractive. Is a, this is a person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't just an extension of me. Yeah. This is a person. So it's the indirect things that, that contribute. And so let's now take that to the single place. I'm, I'm single. What's, what do I do next? Mm-hmm. Understand and study. And this is a big part of what I do in my work. So I'd encourage people to come check that out. Study the things that contribute to getting you a relationship that often have nothing to do with getting a relationship. The things you do with your spare time. Do I, you know, do I do, if I want to learn yoga, do I do it on my own at home with a YouTube video? Learning yoga, by the way, on its own could be a good thing just because it makes you more interesting. You have more to talk about. You feel confident in yourself, all of that. But Okay, now let me do a more sociable version of that. Let me go and do a class where I might actually have the chance of meeting other people. Maybe they're not men, maybe they're other single women, but other single women are useful too. Another indirect variable, Mm -hmm. because you have more single friends or more fun friends, more charismatic friends, friends who come knocking at your door going, hey, we're going out. Get out of your goddamn pajamas. We're going out, right? right? That person is going to be great for your love life. Makes you more desirable, have more value. And makes you leave the house. Yeah. Instead of staying in every weekend, makes you leave and go to places where people are. You know, the books you read, who would say the books you read have anything to do with your relationship, but they do on a date when you have shit to talk about. Absolutely. Right? So there's all these factors. Now, the reason I'm saying that, because of course there are direct factors, but look, my programs in my, in my company, which by the way, people could go to howtogettheguy.com to go and find all of these. But the programs I have there are about very direct things like how to flirt, strategies, how yeah, to meet yeah. someone, how to do this, how to do that. But that's one piece of it, right? It's, I encourage people to do all those indirect things. And then someone can't say, I'm just sick of going out. I'm, I'm, I'm give, I give up. On what? <laughs> On what? Yeah. Like someone said that to me in a seminar and said, I just feel like giving up. Tell me what, what on yourself on life. What are you giving up on? Yeah, I, yeah. I want to hear this. Tell me what are you giving up on? Well, I uh, <laughs> meeting people. Meeting people. Would you not meet people if you if someone said you can never find the love of your life? That's off the table. Would you really stop meeting people? Yeah. Your need for a human interaction would disappear. I don't think so. You'd stop flirting with people. That's part of your character. Flirt, being flirtatious is a part of who we are at times. Yeah. So why would we lose that? Being sexual, would you really lose that? You're gonna stop being sexual just because the end result isn't coming? I, I don't buy it. You'd stop doing hobbies, you'd stop getting out there. You, you, all the things that you have to get rid of to say I'm done with relationships are things that would absolutely erode your life. Even if you take the relationship out of the equation. Yeah. So I think people have to, I understand, I know there is a terrific level of like dating burnout right now. And if you're out there feeling that right now, I, I urge you to think about this differently and to say, I don't have to constantly have it in my mind. I'm trying to meet someone, I'm trying to meet someone, I'm trying to meet someone. That game gets boring. And now when you go on a date and it doesn't go anywhere, you're a failure. And you're you know? exhausted, yeah. Oh, God, I'm done. See it as life. This isn't dating, it's life. It's meeting people, Mm -hmm. it's experiencing a great conversation, having a fun moment of interaction or flirtation, doing things you wanna do anyway, doing hobbies you wanna do anyway. Because they're 
enrich your experience of life. All of those things are really important. You don't have to call it dating. Just go live. It's kind of like the analogy you said about running a business. If you're focused on, I need the relationship, whereas like, I need to make a certain amount of money, yep. is, the, is getting the relationship as opposed to, why don't I add value to the world and I'll attract the customers that will pay me and I'll make some yeah, money. Because I need to make money focuses on things that make the short term economics mm -hmm. work. Yeah. And those things are generally not good for a business. That's it. Right? Yeah. Same, in, same in love. I want to I ask you a couple of final questions. This just came to me. I don't think I've ever asked anyone this, but since you're the love guy, I'm going <laughs> to go there. Um, Typically, I would ask the three truths question, which mm. is what are your three truths if it was the last day of your life? But I'm gonna ask you a different spin on this. Imagine it's the last day of your life and you've been in a, a committed, compatible, loving relationship with the woman of your dreams for the last 30, 40, 50, whatever years. And you've been a part of this journey and experience where you've built this incredible castle with all of its dents and wears and tears and love and magic and unicorns and everything. <clears throat> and it's your last day mm. and you've got a, the lights are going to go off and you're not going to be on this world anymore. And your partner has one more day to live. Hypothetical. You, so your you're partner, 150 your, years old. Your partner has one more day to your, live. Your partner has one more day to live. Let's screw that. Your partner has a few more years to live. She's going to live a little longer than you. And you get to write three things, a love letter to your partner. Right. About the three things you loved about her the most. That brought you the most joy, the most incredible life mm. from this relationship that you built together. Mm. What would you say or write to her are the three things you loved the most? about this woman that she uh, would remember and go on for a few more years afterwards. And but that would be specific to a relationship, right? To a specific person. To that relationship, yeah. To that person and the relationship. Imagine the relationship is everything you could ever dream of. Got you, it. You created the relationship of your dreams. It's the golden standard for the world wow. to look at a relationship and say, wow, they lived it. They Oof. did it, they loved it. They went through it. They were vulnerable. It wasn't perfect, but man, this couple is the golden standard. Man, okay. What would you say are the Same. three things? So I want you to go there because I believe you're going to create that in the relationship that you want to create. So what were the three things you, you would write a love letter to your, your wife on your last day about the three things you appreciated the most about the love you created together? that maybe one would be your you made me feel safe enough to be the best I could possibly be you know mm. you your love made me feel so secure gave me such a platform to go and make an impact in the world on that that you know and I, don't get me wrong i think we should have our internal security but i felt so secure in the relationship that this gave me this relationship gave me the energy mm. to go out there and do amazing things with that energy so i made a bigger impact in the world because of the energy that wow. your love gave me. I'm getting chills already. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> this makes me emotional just thinking about it. if I have anywhere to go from there. <laughs> um, so safety, security. That you... You made me feel like I wasn't alone in the world. And I don't just mean because we had each other. Mm -hmm. You can feel very lonely in a relationship especially if you don't feel seen. Mm. But you find someone who sees you, you know, who, know, who really gets you. And all of a sudden you don't feel 
so alone in the world because life is lonely. Uh, you can have tons of people around you, but there are certain, there's a certain existential loneliness that many people feel in life that for moments or times evaporates when you feel a true connection with someone and you see each other. You go, wow, this is, that's a, that to me is transcendent. So you, your ability to see me made me feel less alone in the world. Yeah. Um, and I guess you, you were a role model for me. Wow. That through observing you and seeing the way you live and seeing the way you approach things, that there were so many times where I noticed you were better than me. And that taught me how to be better. It taught me how to, you, I grew because I saw the way you were. Wow. And that showed me, no matter where I thought I was, being around you showed me, uh, how wonderful people can be. And that made me want to be more wonderful. Mm. Hey, I guess those would be That's three. That's a beautiful love letter. What's the letter you would write to yourself? You're 200 years old, it's the last day still. Hmm. And you'd write a letter to your 32 year old self. 32 now? 31, 32 in a couple of weeks. You write a letter to your 32 year old self and say, one piece of advice, looking back at what you'd say to yourself on how to become the best partner to create that magical relationship. One thing I would say, looking back at, looking at myself, sure. saying, here's a, here's here's the a piece guide of advice. to being a, Here's what you need to do to, to become that partner with that, uh, with that other person. Here's what you need to let go of. Here's what you need to step into. Here's where your ego needs to take a check. I think, how many things do I get? Give yourself a few. Let's do, let's do a couple. Yeah. I, I think, um, I always loved just the, the idea of you know, question everything. Mm, you know, yeah. do, don't, that thing that you take for granted that you're right about, you know, question everything. Cause it's, I mean, it's just amazing to me the things I, I look back on now and I no longer disagree, I no longer agree with what the 23 year old version of me thought or the 25 year old version of me thought. Or, and I think understanding that, at least, we're not very good at thinking about all the ways we might be wrong today. But we're really good at knowing <laughs> the ways we were wrong before, right. right? And it's more, that's, you know, if you think of a lot, a lot of self-improvement people, right? Gurus, leaders, whatever, you know, people want to call themselves. Uh, they struggle, they're very good at telling stories of how they fucked up. Ah, oh, five years ago or ten yeah. years ago, but now you're you should have seen me then. <laughs> but not many people are good at talking about today. Yeah, and I think that that's a kind of blind spot we we all, uh, most of us have in life, people in general. And I think if we can apply that thing of, oh yeah, God, I was so wrong about that five years ago. Mm -hmm. I was so I couldn't be more wrong about that, and I know that now. Mm -hmm. We should apply that to the next five years too. Yeah, you know, in the next ten years, and say. There's a lot of shit I'm gonna look back on five years from now and say, God, I did not know what I was talking about. That doesn't mean we should not trust ourselves on anything. You know, there's, I've heard it said, you know, strong opinions loosely held. You know, there, sure. it doesn't mean we shouldn't <clears throat> be passionate about what we think now, but it does mean we should leave room for yeah. questioning. Um, and to that end, I think I would tell myself to, to be kinder to myself over the course of my life for things that I'd, mistakes I'd made within relationships. I have definitely, I have definitely been the person and even today have to wrestle with making, doing something that I know, God, oh, that wasn't the best reaction to that. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd have handled that differently. I wish I'd have said a different thing. I wish I'd have phrased that differently. I wish I didn't say that. 
and then really, really beating myself up for it. Yeah. You know, not letting it go. <clears throat> even after you've finished the argument, even after you get to the other Holding side of it, it yeah. continuing to, to berate yourself for it. And, and the, the shame about that is that it lacks humanity. It, it f makes us forget that we're human and that we don't get everything right. And the only way we're gonna get more right is by making certain mistakes and learning from them. It's true. And it also stops us from being effective because that energy that we're putting into to berating ourselves is actually stopping us from doing the very things that would move everything forward from that mistake. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, it doesn't <clears throat> make relationships better. Mistakes actually make relationships better very often. Because you learn, or you hopefully you learn. You learn. Those things, they, they really can transform, mistakes can transform relationships, but not if you sit there consistently dwelling on them. They make relationships better if you can improve from them and move on and be the thing you want to be now. So I think I would tell myself to be, be kinder to myself for, for mistakes, yeah. and to not obsess over things I should have said or done differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what, to that end, we, we should, halfway through this interview, I was, kept losing my train of thought. And probably you were gonna edit that out to be kind to me. I'm gonna keep it in? Let's keep it in. All right. Because, <laughs> like. Don't beat yourself up over it. Give people the real shit. Yeah. Matthew Hussey's really eloquent. Oh, look at the way he could string a thought together. Well, I lost, I, I lost my train of thought three or four times. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't think of the thing I was going to say next. I kept, kept blanking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Show people that. That's, mm. that's inspiring. Yeah. Oh, fuck. If Matthew Hussey can be in the <laughs> middle of an interview and just go completely blank and not know what the hell he was saying, yeah. then what am I worried about? Yeah, that's certainly. more interesting. And that's, you know, that's a real relationship. Yeah. A real mm. relationship. That's, that's the real stuff. That's the stuff we're not seeing. When we see other people's relationships and everything things the highlight seems reels. great and everything. No, let's like, if we want to, if we want to change our world, forget the world for a moment, because it always seems a bit grandiose when we talk about changing the world, but changing our world. Let's bring in the real. Because that, that genuinely changes things. You know what makes relationships better? True realness, vulnerability, people living their truth, people being more real, being more upfront, more direct. You know what makes you more attractive on a date? Being more real. Mm -hmm. Not going there, you people worry about their hair and like, is this all right? Be, tell a real fucking story on the date. Yeah. That's what's gonna, you wanna talk about deep attraction, not surface level bullshit? Deep, surface level bullshit is in 2D on Instagram. Deep attraction, the kind of attraction that gets relationships comes from real stories, yeah. real shared experiences. And if, you want, and if you do want to change other people's worlds, as you know, because you're so good at it, it's bring people the real. Because yeah. that's more inspiring than the guy who sits there and does great for an hour mm -hmm. and always knows exactly what he's going to say. The perfect person, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not as interesting. I love this, man. Those are good insights for you. Hopefully that's helpful for your life, reflecting on that. Yeah, you've, I mean, that was, yeah. You ask a hell of a question. <laughs> You're great though, man. You're great at what you do. And oh, I have I to, it, I know that you, you say a lot about, you know, you, I hear you talk a lot about gratitude and you ask people questions mm -hmm. constantly about that. And I have to share my gratitude for you mm -hmm. while we're here to, to honor you to your audience because you have, you know, I've been through difficult things and I've given you the phone call mm -hmm. at difficult times in my life yeah. where, you know, I'm like, Lewis, I need someone to talk to, man. And you've given me the time, sat down with me mm -hmm. and been a voice for me that yeah. is sober and out yeah. of my own head and, and been truly kind in kind and wise, which is a good mm -hmm. combination mm -hmm. when someone's not just being kind to you, but they also are saying things that are very, very astute and helpful and you've been that for me in some in some really difficult moments yeah, and I, I remember in those moments thinking god i'm so going home and thinking how grateful i am for that friendship yeah 
and and hoping and that more people get that for themselves yeah. because it's a tremendous thing when you have it. So nice, thank brother. you for that. I appreciate it. It's been a beautiful four years. It really has. I'm excited for 40 more, man. I'm let's hey, let's 40 keep more. putting paint on the wall. I mean, you know, man, we got to keep building. Happens. We got to keep building. And I'll say to anyone out there right now who's watching, um, because I want to, I'd love to give you a way to kind of continue the journey with me. Uh, if I'm resonating with you, there is a, a wonderful video. I, I do my retreats twice a year, as you know, they're a mm -hmm. six day program. And I urge anyone to uh, apply for that. If you, you know, can create six days to transform your life. It's a game changer. Please, please, please apply. That's at MatthewHussyRetreat.com. But I also created an at home version of this for people who aren't able to come to the live mm -hmm. event. And you can obviously go and do that program and I would encourage you to do it. But what I've done is taken a, a training piece from that and I'm giving it away as a gift. And that's, I literally bring a woman on stage, this beautiful, gorgeous soul, Alexandria, I bring her on stage and we really transform her perspective and her confidence in a sh mm. kind of very relatively short space of time. And people can see what's possible for themselves in their confidence by mm. watching this video and by watching the process that I take yeah. her through. Where so can you get that? that's at getmattssecret.com, Matt with two Ts, getmattssecret.com. Um, you know, just go there, put in your email address, you can download, you can be watching it immediately, um, five minutes from now. But it's very, very powerful. <clears throat> and for anyone who's like, oh no, I, you know, I wanted more of this, they can, you can go and get more there. Yeah, and subscribe to you on YouTube because I watch your videos and I'm not a girl. You know, there are four women, but yeah. I'm like, I learned so much as a man being in a relationship. When I was single, I would watch them and I was just learning so much. So it doesn't matter who you are. I look forward to every Sunday to getting your email Thanks, for the videos. Thank you. Uh, so make sure you guys subscribe there. Matthew Hussey on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and get mattssecret.com. Uh, final question for you before I ask it, I got to acknowledge you, man, for for constantly being a, a powerful voice in the world for so many women who are suffering. You know, you mostly work with women and there's a lot of women I think who are just suffering because they don't know how to get out of their own way. And you help them gain the confidence by <clears throat> focusing on their life and taking responsibility for life and giving them strategies and tools to really attract love, committed, compatible love. And I think at the end of the day, we all want that connection and that yeah. intimacy and that love and you're providing a safe environment for women to cultivate that within themselves and truly love themselves first so they can attract a partner that they want and equal yeah. that they want so <clears throat> i acknowledge you man it's amazing you've been committed for a decade plus now and you haven't slowed down so thank you and i, I want to say to, i really appreciate you saying that and i want to say to anyone out there i'm i mean i'm on the journey with you mm -hmm. like i'm not <clears throat> I'm not coming from here. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you doing the work for myself. Yeah. I'm my own experiment all the time. Trying you're not, to figure you're not this. perfect? <laughs> man, life's hard. <clears throat> it is, man. Life's hard and I'm, I'm working on it. But I, it's you good, know, I encourage other people to come and you know, work on it with me. There you go. Uh, your fi my final question is what's your definition of a great relationship? I think it's, it's got to be one where one plus one equals three. There you go. Yeah. Matthew Hussey, my man. Appreciate you, Thanks, brother. Man. Appreciate you.